very good morning everyone uh, welcome to master class which is done by indian society of gastroenterology this is the seventh in the series of this uh, uh, master class series 2 and in this series we are talking about uh, the clinical cases uh, the important clinical cases which we see in our day to day clinical practice and how best to invest how best to approach them how do you interpret the clinical signs clinical symptoms and how do you make a diagnosis based upon the clinical uh, clinical symptomatology and clinical features and then what are the best uh, diagnostic tests and how best you plan and treat an individual so till now we have done six master classes and this is a seventh in series and uh, this is on again on very important topic and uh, this is acute pancreatitis and its complications and i'm sure all of you see these patients uh, almost every day uh, coming to your casualty or in the out patients and how do you approach this patient uh, is the topic for today's master class uh, for this master class uh, a couple of things are, are important to say that uh, uh, here there uh, dr usa usa datta that's a pgi chandigarh is organizing a course on emergency in gi diseases and this is a two days program saturday and sunday so they had a wonderful meeting yesterday and today again uh, uh, this meeting uh, is going on even even like to join after the we finish master class uh, you can have a two sessions on a gi emergency that's on liver emergency and uh, luminary emergencies uh, which will continue after 1:30 once we finish our uh, this master class and here all the residents from pgi and surrounding area are 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 at one place that's in varga auditorium of uh, pj chandigarh and, and they are joining us uh, on this program so welcome everyone uh, on this uh, master class uh, let me introduce the faculty for uh, today we have dr uh, ganesh uh, from sri ramchandra hospital in chennai we have dr uh, praveer rai uh, praveer rai is a professor of gastroenterology at sgpgi uh, sgpgi uh, lucknow we have dr sudipto uh, dr sudipto choudhary is a professor at cmc vellore and we have dr jayanta uh, joining from uh, pgi itself and dr jayanta is a associate professor of gastroenterology at pgi chandigarh we also have other faculty members like dr usa is there and i can see lot many people like uh, dr nareesh bhat dr uh, dr sv rana and many of them are there in the uh, in the audience uh, if you have any question so and uh, this case is be, being presented from srm institute at uh, at uh, sri ramchandra institute at chennai and there are two uh, trainees from there uh, dr gautam and dr vikrant uh, they will present the case so please do send your questions on the chat box and uh, all the faculty uh, will take these questions all along I also need to introduce uh, Dr. Pawan Rawal, uh, who is sitting with Dr. Jayanto, and uh, he will also be one of the moderators. To uh, facilitate all this uh, master class for today, uh, we have Dr. Sridhar Sundaram. He is a again associate professor of gastroenterology at uh, Tata Medical Center or Tata Memorial Hospital in in Mumbai. So he will uh, coordinate uh, the whole uh, program for today. With this, I hand over uh, to. Uh, to all the faculty to run this case uh, dr ganesh dr sudipto dr praveer and uh, janta all yours thank you so much sir good morning everybody uh, well, nice to meet all of you today morning we are presenting a case from ramachandra institute of medical sciences porur and we have one case of acute pancreatitis to be discussed by dr vikrant and dr gautam dr vikrant will deal with the history and clinical presentations and dr gautam will deal with the investigations and management over to dr sridhar uh thank you so much sir so i think uh, we'll start with uh, the history first so i think vikrant uh, can take over good morning everyone uh, i am presenting a case of a 52 year old male who was admitted twice in our hospital in the month of april and august 
is a 52 year old male graduate businessman who came with the chief complaints of recurrent abdominal pain twice once in the month of april and second in the month of august 2021 and fever for the past four days next history of present illness during the first admission patient came with the chief complaints of upper abdominal pain of two days duration which was sudden in onset severe deep pouring pain which is causing the patient to rip within uh, in his bed and it was radiating to the back which was aggravated with foot intake relieved with medication and on leaning forward he also had nausea and vomiting in addition to the pain of two days duration which was bilious non projectile and immediately after foot intake containing food particle without any blood it was reduced or relieved with reducing the oral intake for the above said complaints he was admitted for a period of 10 days in the hospital out of which the first 6 days was spent in the icu he also developed shortness of breath during the first admission for which he required oxygen mask he also had fever with chills and rigors during the hospital stay which relieved during the course of admission he was kept npo treated with iv fluids and support to care he was found he was told that he was having a problem with his pancreas but no active intervention uh, or uh, endoscopic or surgery was done for him he improved with support to care and discharged with oral medication on the follow up period he was on opd uh, follow up after a period of 1 month he came to the opd he had significant improvement in the symptoms all her symptoms all his symptoms were significantly decreased but he had mild abdominal discomfort in the form of intermittent dull aching pain two to three times per week which increased with foot intake and lasted for a period of 1 hour he did not have any nausea or vomiting and his oral intake during the time was normal a screening ultrasound was done one month after the discharge during which time he noticed a small pan uh, he was told that he was having a small pancreatic collection but no intervention was done for the same and the current admission was 4 months after the initial complaints during which time the patient had four days history of pain the character of pain was similar to the previous admission 4 months back but on top of the pain abdomen he also had fever of four days duration which was high grade intermittent associated with the chills and rigors but no other localizing features of the fever were present apart from the pain abdomen his appetite was fairly normal and he did not have any history of weight loss he did not have any jaundice abdominal distension hematemesis melina there was no history of any trauma or recent drug use his bowel movements were normal with normal stool consistency and color his past history he is not a diabetic or hypertensive prior to the past four uh, complaint four months back he did not have any similar complaints before that there is no history of any surgeries he is not a smoker he does not consume alcohol and there is no history of iv drug abuse his dietary history his caloric requirement is 2200 kilo calorie with 68 g protein requirement with a deficit of 300 kilo calorie and 20 g of protein in dietary intake his family history none of his family members have uh, had any similar complaints and there is no history of any gm malignancies in his family members he belonged to upper middle class modified fukushima scale this is a brief summary of the timeline during the first admission that is in the month of april the patient had pain abdomen vomiting nausea for which he required icu admission following which he was discharged he had minimal symptoms in the form of abdominal discomfort two to three times per week and was told to have small correction one uh, collection pancreatic collection one month after the initial admission and the current admission is in the month of august where he had pain abdomen nausea on top of that he also had fever summarizing the history a 52 year old male who is a graduate tea toddler without any comorbidities presented with recurrent pain abdomen probably of pancreatic origin first episode of pain abdomen vomiting shortness of breath was 4 months back which he required icu admission managed conservatively without any intervention 
discharged with oral medication had minimal abdominal discomfort and small pancreatic collection during the 4 months follow up period and current admission patient had abdo- uh, pain abdomen on top of that he had fever with chills and rigors for a duration of 4 days thank you vikrant for the history so we'll go on to the first poll question for the audience uh i think if you can run the poll question so what do you think is the differential diagnosis or uh, in this case is it acute pancreatitis with a local complication if it's a recurrent acute pancreatitis acute on chronic pancreatitis with a local complication or if the diagnosis is something apart from any of this so so uh, can i come in uh, sridhar hi hi uh. hi uh, so as you put up this questions just to ask you uh, ask uh, vikrant uh, vikrant a v- wonderful presentation and thanks for uh, thanks for this just to ask you how would you uh, define recurrent acute pancreatitis so recurrent acute pancreatitis is defined as a uh, two episode of acute pancreatitis with an inter- interval of at least 3 months in between with no evidence of any co- chronic pancreatitis or peripancreatic fluid collections right so as you know there have been different dif- uh, definitions of recurrent acute pancreatitis per se the one of these definition is from the inspire group which has said that if you have two episodes of pancreatitis more than one month apart with complete resolution of pain in between or there is another definition from the inspire group which says two episodes of pa- uh, pancreatitis without any time interval but where the amylase lipase completely normalizes between the two episodes but there now we are looking at more of a mechanistic definition of recurrent acute pancreatitis where the morphological changes are not more important what we are looking at what the definition is is a syndrome of multiple distinct acute inflammatory responses originating within the pancreas in individuals who have either genetic environmental traumatic or morphological risk factors and where the episodes are separated by at least 3 months so there are differences as regards the definition of recurrent acute pancreatitis as their time is concerned and probably because we really don't know the time frame at which pancreas really recovers okay uh thank you sir so i'll be sharing the results of the of the poll so 50 uh, 64% of the audience actually feels this is acute pancreatitis with a local complication 18% felt it is recurrent acute pancreatitis 16% felt uh, it was acute on chronic pancreatitis with a local complication uh, so just a brief discussion on uh, yes one second so a severity grading in acute pancreatitis is something that we should be knowing as part of routine clinical practice because most of our patients have to be prognosticated and based on severity grading we should be able to say how severe the pancreatitis is so there have been different classifications that have been given over a period of time initially in 92 the atlanta classification came in but the terminologies were not very clear uh, subsequently there was a revised atlanta classification that was given in 2013 which is what uh, we fa- follow at the moment so you can see that the revised atlanta classifies it into mild moderately severe and severe uh, acute pancreatitis this is what uh, is practiced routinely in clinical practice by most people uh, and also in various clinical trials uh, the revised atlanta also gave classification for peripancreatic fluid collections they divided it into four types acute peripancreatic fluid collections uh, or pseudocysts Uh, in case of interstitial edematous pancreatitis and in case of necrotic necrotizing pancreatitis into acute necrotic collections and wall of necrosis now management is largely dependent on uh, these terminologies also so which is why it is something that we should be aware of. uh coming to the next poll question how is organ failure defined in patients with oh, acute pancreatitis uh, shridhar can we just hold on for a minute okay uh, yeah so i, I think uh, vikrant can you come to the uh, Uh, summary of the history because i think we have uh, first year second year dm residents as well can i go back sir yeah please yeah i'll do that yeah yeah so uh, vikrant i think we have totally yes. surrendered uh, ourselves to a definite diagnosis but before we do that can you just tell me what makes you think of this particular diagnosis which 65% of the students have agreed to so 
you need to analyze the symptoms that you have put forward in the history. Moreover, there are certain things I think which we need to know more about the history in which you have which you have presented. So, can you analyze the symptoms, Vikram? Sir, yes, sir. Sir, the patient had uh, uh, pain suggested of pancreatic pain four months back, for which he required ICU admission for a period of six days and a total hospital stay of ten days, indicating the patient had significant pancreatic pathology during his first admission. And uh, uh, during the period of follow for a period of uh, four months, the patient has not been completely uh, asymptomatic. He did have mild symptoms in between for the past four months. And he also was told that he had some amount of pan very pancreatic collection, indicating that the acute event which has occurred four months back may not have been completely resolved. And there is some amount of, uh, 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 some amount of uh, damage which is persisting in the present patient which might have aggravated during the current admission, during the uh, recent admission, either due to infection or uh, any other secondary uh, precipitating event causing the second admission. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the point that uh, I'm trying to make is based on history, you have certain very, very important features to suggest that this is possibly pancreatitis and the other differential is quite less in this particular case. So typical pain in the upper abdomen, radiation to the back, persisted for around two days period, severe pain. So which possibly suggests that it's not alone a biliary colic, but possibly related to pancreas. So in biliary colic, you have pain persisting for less than six hours, which is not the case in this particular scenario, in this particular scenario where you had pain persisting for two days in the prior admission. So this suggests that possibly pancreas is in play. Moreover, you had an imaging which suggested a collection. So what you're assuming is possibly a moderately severe pancreatitis. Okay, so if you are thinking of based on this, if you are thinking of moderately severe pancreatitis or pancreatitis, so I think it's very important to take a drug history. So there are many, many drugs, commonly used drugs, which are known to cause pancreatitis. So it's very important to know these drugs. I think we have at least 30 drugs which have established established relationship with pancreatitis and more than 300 drugs which are known to have possibly play a role in acute pancreatitis. So some commonly used drugs that you can have causing pancreatitis may be tetracycline, maybe carbazepine, valproate, isoniazid. So these drug history becomes very, very important to know if because this patient what you presented is possibly not an alcoholic so these history become very relevant uh, shridhar you can uh, carry on with your poll now thank you sir okay uh, so how is organ failure uh, defined in patients with uh, acute pancreatitis uh, so is it the ranson criteria apache score bicep score or the modified marshall score Uh, so, 65% uh, said it's the modified Marshall score, 17% felt it was the Apache score, 10% felt it was the Ramson criteria, and 7% felt it was the BICEP score. So, uh, the correct answer is modified Marshall mm -hmm. score is used for uh, severe organ failure mm -hmm. in, uh, as per the revised Atlanta classification. This is something that, again, we use routinely in clinical practice, and ev all, everyone should be aware. Uh, so I have one last question before we go on to the discussion. Uh, so what proportion of patients uh, progress to chronic pancreatitis after an index episode of acute pancreatitis? Okay. Uh, so 37% felt it was 10%, 28% felt 15%, and 25% felt it was 5%. So uh, the answer is 10%. So there is a meta-analysis of uh, 14 studies published in gastroenterology in 2015, almost 8,400 patients. Uh, so recurrence after an index episode was to the tune of 22%. Chronic pancreatitis is seen in 10% after a single episode. 
and in 36% after the current episode then smoking alcohol and male gender were associated with higher risk of progression now there is one indian study uh, from western india with 97 patients of acute pancreatitis they found that 27% develop recurrence over a median over a median follow up of 32 months and 18.6% in that study had evidence of chronic pancreatitis and follow up so uh, this is for the indian data just to add to it uh, sridhar we did a look at that and we found that with each episode of pancreatitis when we looked at the degree of stiffness of fibrosis in the pancreas in our study we found that with each episode of pancreatitis there's an incremental evidence of stiffness of fibrosis within the pancreatic parenchyma going on to show that every episode of pancreatitis only leads to further fibrosis and progression towards chronic pancreatitis so uh, it is just uh, it is just uh, common sense to say that every episode will only lead on to further chronic pancreatitis and a single episode of severe pancreatitis can lead on to uh, chronic pancreatitis or what we call as the sentinel acute pancreatitis defects so having said this if a person has a severe pancreatitis at the start of it where the almost the entire pancreas melts away possibly that person can go on to develop exocrine insufficiency in the long run yeah uh Uh, sudeep sir i'd like to just chip in over here uh, yeah, regarding yeah. this part of whether a single attack of pancreatitis can lead to chronicity or not i guess if we see all these results that uh, i mean all these data that uh, shridhar has pointed out probably the uh, crux of the issue that the residents should understand is that a single episode of let's say a gallstone pancreatitis need not lead to a chronic pancreatitis yeah. Yeah. until unless it's a very massive kind of pancreatitis destroying the whole of the pancreatitis which we earlier used to read in our textbooks as something called as uh, complete damage of the pancreas with obstruction of the pancreatic duct leading to this chronicity other than that if you see the risk factors for chronic uh, uh, development of chronicity are smoking alcohol etc so basically probably the first attack of pancreatitis was the harbinger of a disease process of pathogenesis that will go on for the next few years to eventually lead this patient to chronic pancreatitis i think that, uh, that is the yeah, yeah. that is the whole pathogenic mechanism that must be going on at the back until and unless the pancreas melts away completely at the first step of itself unlikely that the person will go on to develop chronic pancreatitis uh, absolutely yeah, okay so uh, one one more point that i would like to make here is that once you have a treatable cause like biliary pancreatitis so mild pancreatitis patient is admitted so in these patients obviously if you leave these patients these will have a another episode uh, say around 8 to 10% within a period of 40 days suppose there is a bile duct stone which has been not uh, uh, if there is a gallstone disease and you don't intervene don't do a cholecystectomy at the time of admission then there is a risk of around 8 to 10% within a period of 40 days so these patients should obviously with early with mild pancreatitis these patients should undergo early cholecystectomy rather than leaving gallbladder in situ sir pravi sir to this uh, point i'd like to ask one question to you as well as uh, dr sudeep to sir is that do you believe that let's say a gallstone related pancreatitis is there a patient develops the first attack you do not do a cholecystectomy the patient develops a second or a third attack let's say in a span of a one year or a one and a half years does this group of cohort of rare patients definitely rare cohort but will they eventually develop chronicity uh, because as sudeep sir has highlighted that with every attack of pancreatitis the fibrosis or the stiffness of the pancreas kept on increasing according to his study yeah so i think uh, it's very obvious that recurrent episodes of pancreatitis due to any cause will lead to chronicity for sure so the the point that i'm trying to make is that if you have some treatable cause especially yes. gallstones these should not be left so if you read the literature especially in gallstone disease the risk of pancreatitis recurrent pancreatitis increases over time so these patients should undergo if it's mild disease within the same admission they should undergo cholecystectomy if they have moderate or severe pancreatitis moderate pancreatitis maybe after 2 to 4 weeks after getting a suitable imaging maybe a ct scan or mr when we don't have any evidence of large collections or less of inflammation so that the patient can undergo a safe cholecystectomy absolutely yeah, i think it's going to sorry to chip in again uh, sorry this discussion probably will continue a little bit more uh, sridhar but to just chip in here we have to discriminate two uh, two uh, entities again one is where there's an obvious gallstone another when we are talking of microlithiasis 
Right, sir. When you're talking of microlithiasis, the story becomes slightly much more, more complicated. Now, if you look at Dr. Garg's study, which came out in 2007, including 75 patients uh, of gallstone pancreatitis, 50% actually went on to develop chronic pancreatitis despite having had a cholecystectomy done. Such a study done from our center went on to show that almost 25% went on to develop chronic pancreatitis. Having said this, what it means to say is that what we don't know here is that whether microlithiasis is a subset of patients who already, because of recurrent episodes, had developed chronic pancreatitis in the long term. So these are some unanswered questions here, which we don't want to confuse the residents with. But what we want to say is that when there's obvious gallstones, we should go ahead with cholecystectomy as soon as possible. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, I think uh, the grant can again take over. This is a... With the above said history, I would like to consider the syndromic diagnosis of uh, recurrent upper abdominal pain, probably of pancreatic origin, which is complicated by the fever. The differential diagnosis in the above said case, I would first consider as a sentinel event, which has occurred four months back, which persisted and uh, causing local complications of infected pancreatic cirrhosis or ward of necrosis. My second differential is recurrent acute pancreatitis with local complication. Uh, since the patient had some amount of collection on the follow-up ultrasound after one month, and uh, the final uh, down the list, I would like to consider acute on chronic pancreatitis with local complications. Since the patient did not have any history of significant weight loss or prior abdominal pain or steatorrhea, uh, uh, steatorrhea. Uh, coming to the etiology, the patient did not have any obvious insults. Uh, which causes uh, the uh, pancreatitis for him. Since gallstone related is one of the most uh, common cause of pancreatitis, I would like to consider gallstone related pancreatitis. Uh, considering he is uh, uh, greater than 50 years old with the, uh, with the first episode of pancreatitis, we should probably also consider malignancy as one of the uh, etiology. Uh, so, I think Vikrant, at this point of time, you could have well mentioned in the diagnosis about which month of pancreatitis, on the onset of pancreatitis, what's the total duration. So, that again uh, tells you because it is a treatment modalities in first week, second week, third week or beyond may be a little bit different. So, approximately what days, like this possibly around four months from the onset of pancreatitis. And instead yes. of mentioning about, see, this world of pancreatic necrosis may be an imaging diagnosis. This is not a clinical diagnosis. So what you can mention is an infected pancreatic fluid collection because this is what you had in imaging. So necrosis, whether it's present or not, it can only be determined on imaging like CT scan or MR. Without that, what you can say is an infected pancreatic fluid collection. So that would be better. So I think uh, uh, we can further go ahead on this. I go ahead to the examination. I think so. We have only exhausted around 25 minutes. Okay, sir. Yeah. On general examination, he is conscious, coherent, oriented to time, place, and person. There is no signs of any nutritional deficiency. There is no pallor, ictus, clubbing, cyanosis, lymphadenopathy, fetal edema. Oral cavity examination is normal. On vitals examination, his blood pressure is normal. He is having tachycardia with a pulse rate of 106. Respiratory rate, tachypnea with a rate of 22, is febrile with a temperature of 101 degrees Fahrenheit. His oxygen saturation is normal. The patient is currently in uh, SIRS. His anthropometry, his height, weight, and uh, his BMI is appropriate. On abdominal examination, his parabdomen is flat. A palpable lump of size 4 to 5 cm is noted in the epigastrium 3 cm below the ziphoid process. With a smooth surface, the borders of the mask are ill-defined. The mask is tender to touch and it is not moving with respiration. It is becoming less prominent on leg drives. The features were suggestive of a retroperitoneal mask without any intrinsic mobility. His liver span is normal. His spleen is uh, no splenomegaly. Top space is resonant. No free fluid in the abdomen. Bubble sounds are normal. Parental examination is normal. Other system examination, respiratory, cardiovascular, and CNS were within normal limits. Okay. Yeah, uh, so Vikrant, I think uh, uh, what you need to describe here further is, you mentioned about it being a retroperitoneal lung. So what I need to know from you, 
how do you differentiate between a retroperitoneal and an infraperitoneal lung? mass. Sir, uh, retroperitoneal mass, the borders are not well defined and it does not move with the, the respiration. And uh, on uh, uh, forward stooping, the mass does not become more prominent and there's uh, no internal mobility of uh, the retroperitoneal mass. So any other important point? Okay, so what is uh, belotment and lime manual palpation? Sir, so belotability is on uh, uh, placing one hand in the, uh, in the back of the patient and giving certain pressures so that the uh, other hand which is present on the anterior abdominal wall, the, the hand will uh, palpate the mass moving. And the bimanual palpation is a simultaneous palpation of the mass uh, uh, using both hands. Uh, both hands, the mass will be palpable. So what does that indicate? Uh, it indicates uh, belotability is generally seen with the uh, renal mass. Sir. Yeah, so I think it's very important when you are trying to differentiate between a retroperitoneal and intraperitoneal lump. You should mention, like you come to the prior slide, you should mention all the features in the same code. So don't give room for the questions here. So I think all differentiation between a retroperitoneal and intraperitoneal lump should come straight away including uh, its uh, belotment, whether it's present or not, by manually it's palpable or not, so that should come in the same code. Yes. Yeah, so uh, based on this, you have anything to add in the examination here about the abdominal lump? Uh, no, uh, belotable and by manual palpation, sir. Uh, other than that... Uh... Anything else you would like to add to it? Sir, presence of any abdominal lymph nodes in the uh, periumbilical region or any... Uh, um, so, what do you think this lump is? Sir, pancreatic uh, fluid collection, sir. Uh, since it is retroperitoneal and also patient had the history of future suggestion of pancreatitis, the most likely cause is a peripancreatic fluid collection. So you do have any differential or do you think this is clear cut uh, very pancreatic fluid collection what you are seeing? So th this is a mass which is in the epigastrium, right? Yes, sir. And uh, this is a fairly large size mass, three centimeters below the epic epigastrified uh, process with a smooth mass. So it sounds like more. Sorry, it's a bit of an echo going on. Hello. Yeah, sorry. Uh, we can hear. We can hear you. Can go ahead, Shudip, though. You can hear you. Uh, yeah. no, I was just trying to summarize that this, uh, yeah, based on the history, it does sound like an. It does sound like a what? I'm sorry, I'll just smile, mute myself. I think there's a problem. So, uh, Bikram, uh, so the point that I'm trying to make since on history you are thinking in the terms of pancreatitis that's the reason possibly you have made this as a pancreatic fluid collection as the first possibility can you tell me at this particular site what are the other lumps that you can have in this particular site uh epigastric region the contents are uh, uh, stomach sir and the antral region uh, duodenum can be a content and iota is a content uh, in the epigastric region sir uh, and uh, uh, pancreas uh, uh, in pancreas, we can have a, a pseudocyst or wall of necrosis, very pancreatic fluid collection. And uh, uh, in case of uh, 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 CH, uh, stomach uh, could be one of the uh, differential in the epigastric region mass. Sir. And also, uh, aortic aneurysm is a uh, differential of uh, epigastric mass. Sir. What about left and lobe? Sometimes of the you can get a lymph nodal mass out there, also, right? Yes, sir. You can get a large conglomerate of lymph nodes out there and retroperitoneal masses too. Yes. So, like a retroperitoneal so sarcomas, etc. The lymph node masses, the aorta, stomach, left lobe of the liver, besides the pancreatic fluid collections which you can have. So, these are the contents which you can have in the epigastrium. So okay. Easier way to remember the masses is to just divide the nine quadrants 
and imagine the structures which lie in the nine quadrants and then relate the masses which can arise from those structures in the respective quadrants. Probably right. we have to. We move on, Sridhar. Uh, okay, sir. So uh, I have two more full questions before we go ahead. What is the risk of heavy alcohol drink that is more than five days per day developing pancreatitis? Uh, Yogit, you can run the poll, please. Thank you. So the options are 3%, 13%, 23%, and 33%. Okay, uh, so majority people, 44% answered 13%, 25% felt it was 3%, and 20% felt it was 23%. So uh, the answer is 3%. This is a, a, a study, a longitudinal study from Denmark, uh, which had almost, uh, which was actually a study taken from the Danish heart study. And they had uh, a, a large cohort of patients and they followed them up and they found that the risk of acute pancreatitis was 1.6% uh, among heavy uh, chronic pancreatitis was 1.6%. Okay. Uh, so alcohol is the second most common cause of acute pancreatitis after gallstones. So we know that it is associated with fatty acid ethyl esters and associated with increased progression to chronic pancreatitis. So there is a... Uh, Motonic and possibly exponential dose response relationship and a threshold of around four drinks per day is what is considered a risk drinking with respect to pancreatitis. Uh, coming to the last poll question, so what proportion of patients with acute pancreatitis develop pseudosis? 10, 30, 50, and 70%. Okay, uh, so the majority, 57% have answered 10%, 30% uh, felt it was, 41% uh, felt it was 30%. So the correct answer uh, is 10%, it's in the range of five to 16%. Uh, it is an old study, even after this, whatever studies have come, even a meta-analysis actually said it was 10%. So coming to the final diagnosis, and I think, uh, Vikrant and yeah, Dr. So I, I think before Vikrant you comment on final diagnosis, I would just like to add a point here. So as you saw that only 3% of the patient to with, who take alcohol develop uh, pancreatitis. So what one needs to remember is that there are other very, very important factors which are associated, which increase the risk of pancreatitis in alcoholics. Especially smoking has been found to be a very important risk factor. So those who smoke, some genetic factors are involved and some dietary factors also play a role in causing this pancreatitis. Go ahead, Vikram. Add a bit to it, uh, uh, Dr. Praveer. Two recent meta-analyses have actually shown that smoking as an independent risk factor for development of acute pancreatitis. So not only is it a contributor to alcoholic smoking on its own has an independent risk factor for uh, development of uh, chronic acute pancreatitis and the risk is because nicotine somehow tends to decrease the blood flow within the pancreas and increases the calcium levels within the pancreas and leads to uh, activation of zymogens so yeah smoking is a very important risk factor which we tend to miss when we take the history of uh, risk factors in pancreatitis yeah, Vikram, go ahead. So the, the final diagnosis, I would like to slightly modify. Uh, the, instead of putting acute necrotizing pancreatitis, I would like to consider uh, infected uh, pancreatic collection uh, in uh, week 18 of the illness. Etiology is unknown, complicated by uh, sepsis and possibly sepsis without any features of GI bleed, gastric outright obstruction or jaundice. 
I would like to, can I just uh, state my diagnosis and then Dr. Praveer can modify mine too. I would like to call it as acute pancreatitis, moderately severe acute pancreatitis, week uh, 16, etiology unknown, complicated with infected world of necrosis with sepsis without features of GI bleed, gastric outdoor obstruction and jaundice. Now, I don't see why we need to put up anything else other than what you've already put up, just that you have to add on the week to it. What do you say, Dr. Praveer? Yeah, I think that's okay. Yeah, because uh -huh. you don't need to start off with an infected world of necrosis straight on. You have to give the diagnosis of the etiology as well as the organ involvement as the first step and the week of involvement. Absolutely. Sir. So can I uh, yeah, Dr. just make Jaita, a... please go ahead. Yeah, can I make a small modification is that uh, if we go by the history in April when the patient had the first attack, uh, the history suggested that there was shortness of breath for which the patient required ICU admission. So if that is the uh, scenario, then probably we are dealing with a severe uh, uh, pancreatitis rather than moderately severe. Uh, uh, I don't know. What is your take, sir, Sudipta, sir? Or, uh, yeah. Was the ICU admission for two days or less than two days? And that was not very clear to me, actually. What is the oh, short okay. period of ICU? Okay, okay. That was for six days, sir. The ICU was for six days for okay. breathlessness, but he recovered very well. So yeah. then he comes under, uh, I mean... Uh, comes under initially a severe pancreatitis. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely, sir. So um, what I'm not sure is what this ICU admission means. So you can have a patient admitted in ICU without oxygen, maybe in some centers or sure. So I think we need to be sure about whether there is organ dysfunction or not. So absolutely. I think mild pancreatitis, moderately severe and severe, if you see according to, organ, according to Atlanta classification that definition are very, very clear. So mild pancreatitis, we are not having any complication. We are not having any organ failure. Moderately severe pancreatitis, you need to have a transient organ failure. So if respiratory distress was there, it persisted for how long and how much was the PO2 FiO2 ratio? So that we need to have in place before we say that it's moderately severe and moderately oh, severe or severe. So Absolutely. I think uh, we need more information to be very certain whether it was moderately severe or severe. So, yeah. so probably this is the learning point for the residents is that when you're taking a history of acute pancreatitis and if you do not, uh, obviously you will not have the P by F ratios, etc. So you have to very be, be very specific on how many days the patient was on oxygen or let's say these things has to come out in the history very clearly so that you can comment on whether it was a moderately severe or severe as Praviser has pointed out. Srinath, there are some questions in the chat box which probably we could take and then finish off as and when the progresses. Uh, so uh, there's one which is saying that uh, organ failure transient could be less than 48 hours or more than 48 hours to be classified as moderate to severe. Yeah. Any comments on that, sirs? Transient organ failure is defined as less than 48 hours. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, so there is, is it... I think most of these questions have been answered in the discussion. So one was how many attacks of biliary pancreatitis can lead on to chronic pancreatitis if patient is not tackled appropriately. Uh, I think Jayanti, madam, has uh, uh, commented saying it seems more like acute on chronic pancreatitis with dalik persisting between the two episodes. So uh, whether it's a current complication or a fluid collection, which is not known or carcinoma mas masquerading. Uh, and in epigastric mass, would one look for bimanual palpability and palatability? Is uh, Jayanti Madam's comment? So I think. Uh, hello. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, uh, one obviously knows that the allotment is something which is specific for the renal mass. The point is one while you are eliciting the history or telling history in detail, one needs to point about these features so that one needs to be aware that these are the things that you have looked for while you're doing an examination. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think uh, for, for the quantification and duration of alcohol for acute pancreatitis to occur, uh, 
there is large amount of data and I, I don't think we will go into that. Uh, should we add BICEP score in the diagnosis? Uh, uh, again, that would require the investigation. So we cannot really add it to the clinical diagnosis. Uh, what will we say severe on diagnosis and moderately severe at present? Now, is that something that you would want? Uh, I mean, severe at diagnosis and moderately severe at present. Hello? Uh, Ravi sir, Sadap sir, Jayant, if you can just... Uh, Sorry, I just couldn't get the question, so either I... So, I so the question is, if, if we actually say the diagnosis, whether it was severe at the initial diagnosis and moderately severe at present, I mean, is it a dynamic... Uh, uh, definition or is it something that is I mean uh, at the time of diagnosis that you're seeing is what I think the diagnosis of moderately severe and severe is primarily for prognostication of the individual and yeah. management triaging of the individual whether the patient should be managed in the ward in the ICU that's about it and there's nothing else beyond it whether the patient with a severe disease should be managed in the ward or in the ICU setting patient with moderately severe whether what is the long-term prognosis of that yeah. individual. We all know that in the severe a, a, acute pancreatitis, the mortality is higher in the first week of illness. In a moderately severe, the morbidity is higher and the length of hospital stay is longer. That's okay. all we know. Beyond okay. it, I don't think so. We can extrapolate much from that. Okay, okay. Uh, so I, one I, can, I, can I add just one more point? I think, I think uh, Sudhiktu sir, what uh, um, Sridhar wanted to ask was that Will the final diagnosis when the resident writes, will he write it as moderately severe or severe as per the, uh, as, as in this case? In this situation, I believe that uh, the diagnosis remains as single diagnosis. If you're talking about that same pancreatitis, which have happened in April and now got complicated with the local complication, then the diagnosis should be acute necrotizing pancreatitis severe if you're talk, talking about severe or moderately severe. It does not change. And then, then talk change. about the complications. So yeah, whether it's a dynamic definition or whether it's a definition no. that is taken at once, what it is, a it's a dynamic, uh, it's not dynamic, it's a diagnosis yeah. at one. Point. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, so I think uh, there's one more on... question, Sridhar. Okay, how can we comment on necrotizing without imaging? Is it okay at the point of history taking to say that patient has got acute yeah. severe necrotizing pancreatitis? Jayanta, sir. Sorry, sir. I, I think, uh, let us not be uh, let us be very clear about what necrosis means. So necrotizing is obviously a diagnosis of imaging. Imaging. Yeah. Clinically, you are just translating it. That is the possibility that the patient can be having. That's the reason I mentioned, in fact, infected pancreatic uh, collection, pancreatic fluid collection. So uh, obviously, necrosis you determine on imaging. Yeah. Absolutely. Sir. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, should we go ahead with the investigation? Uh, yes. There is uh, two questions from the audience over here. Can we just ask those questions? Do we have time? Yeah, 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 Jayanta, if you can go ahead. Uh, there is one question uh, where one asked that how do you, I mean, uh, you need to explain sudden onset pain? The second episode when a sudden onset pain occurred. That is the question, I guess. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think Vikrant and, and Gautam, if you can take that. How do you explain the sudden onset pain in this patient? I mean, a sudden onset four-day pain that the patient is actually having. Sir, the, uh, probably he might be having uh, a second episode uh, or a persisting uh, uh, pancreatic parenchymal inflammation uh, during the pre uh, present presentation in addition to the infection uh, could be uh, one thing that... Uh, needs to be considered uh, in this patient, sir. On top of the uh, pancreatic collection, the parenchymal inflammation um, might also be present in this patient. Yeah, so Vikram, this patient developed fever as well. So fever, uh, maybe infection that possibly led to the uh, occurrence of pain, or it's a new attack of pancreatitis that, is, that has happened. These are the two differentials that you can put forward. Yeah. Yes, I think the question probably stems with the with the word of sudden, is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the word of uh, the uh, the adjective sudden is where the <laughs> emphasis is. <laughs> and you know, when you say sudden in abdominal pain, there can be only two differentials: perforation and infarction. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I think that's a very good question here. Vikram, that's a beautiful question and we should appreciate that question. Uh, that when a person mentions sudden abdominal pain, there can be only two differentials. Either it's a perforation or an infarction. 
And in the setting of acute pancreatitis, you're looking at mesenteric venous thrombosis. So, you know, that's a beautiful question and I appreciate that question really. Yeah, uh, so Vikrant, can you tell me what your sudden means? <laughs> I what attributed you it to the... You mentioned sudden. Uh, I attributed it initially to the infection, sir. Uh, and no, secondly, no, no, no. the... How sir. sudden was the pain? Uh, sir, it uh, evolved a period of uh, one day, sir. It, it's not uh, that sudden. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think you can Sorry, Vikrant. Vikrant, uh, one thing, uh, once because the patient was totally or almost asymptomatic with milder symptoms in between for four months, that brings us to a point that what is the natural history of development of blood of necrosis or cirrhosis as a complication over and above acute of, uh, episode of acute pancreatitis. So is it a right time, four months? How many patients would develop after four months, two months, three months? I mean, that's the right thing we should discuss over here. Uh, uh, sir, uh, the, uh, I think the pancreatic fluid collection and uh, the uh, world of necrosis, I think, will about over a period of uh, greater than four weeks, sir, but I'm not sure uh, since the sentinel event was uh, four weeks, uh, four months back, uh, uh, I'm not sure how uh, it, in the current patient has over a period of uh, four months. I think the patient might be having a, a small a subclinical episodes uh, which might have added to the collection which uh, got infected. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I think the question Vikrant was what is the natural history of a patient who develops a cirrhosis or a wall of necrosis? Okay, that, that is the question. So what is the natural history of wall of necrosis or pseudocyst? Sir, acute pancreatic uh, collection uh, uh, will evolve into pseudocyst after a, a period of four months and acute ne uh, necrotic collection after a period of, of sorry, four weeks uh, uh, will evolve into uh, 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 infected world of necrosis. Uh, out of the 10% uh, uh, who develop, 20% uh, who develop uh, uh, acute uh, pancreatic collection, almost half of them will resolve spontaneously, only the other half will develop into pancreatic pseudocyst. And also the similar findings in uh, acute uh, necrotizing pancreatitis, almost 60% uh, will resolve without any uh, treatment uh, and only the rest of the 40% will evolve into the uh, world of necrosis. And 70% uh, of the world of necrosis, uh, uh, 35 to 70% of the world of necrosis have a chance of developing the uh, infected world of necrosis. Uh, can we go to uh, the investigation? Yes, yeah, I think yeah, we can yeah, forward. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gautam. I will be discussing the investigation part of this uh, case. Uh, so, Gautam, you can tell me what investigation you want first. Sir, I would like to have a basic a CBC, uh, LFT, RFT, and serum MLS and lipos. Okay. This is a CBC of the patient. From the left to right, uh, it is sequenced in uh, first admission, discharge, and the second admission uh, investigations. During the first admission, there was a significant uh, leukocytosis, uh, neutrophilic uh, predominant leukocytosis, and uh, PCV also uh, high with a value of 47. And during the discharge, uh, Sorry, these, uh, I missed that. Could you say it again, please? Yeah, go ahead. During the, uh, during the course of hospital, uh, the leukocytosis has come down and uh, PCV have uh, improved. And uh, uh, during the second admission, the patient again had uh, increased total counts with uh, similar uh, uh, neutrophilic uh, leukocytosis. Okay. Uh, yes. No, no. Before we go ahead, I think come back to the prior slide. So, what does this TLC mean to you? Yes, sir. Uh, generally, uh, total counts in acute pancreatitis can rise either due to cysts or due to infections. Coming to the uh, pancreatitis, if it, the rise in uh, total counts in first week, generally in the first 24 to 48 hours, we generally attribute it to the cysts component. And in case if uh, total counts are being persistent even after five days of the 
uh, presentation, we might think of uh, infection, infection process. Okay. Sure. So here on the investigation done on 20, 20th August, it shows 19,800 count, 80%, 85% police. So what does that mean to you now at this point of time? Uh, at this point, I would suspect infection, sir, at this point. Because uh, in our examination, we found uh, an epigastric uh, mass and they had a significant history of high-grade fever. So with the, that history and this finding, uh, I would think first as infection, sir. Infection of uh, pancreatic fluid collection. So he has SIRS, right? He has lymphocytosis. He has got tachycardia. He's got fever. He's got two out of the three criteria for SIRS. Yes. Yeah. So at this, that's point, all we can see. You're expecting an infected pancreatic collection. This is what you want to say. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yeah. During the first admission, the leukocytosis, uh, I would attribute to see. Sir. That was SIRS. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay. And coming to the amylase lipase, uh, uh, at uh, present admission, the amylase level is uh, uh, 1100 and serum lipase is uh, 8, 890. Um, so which, why is which that is, yes, sir. Why is it still elevated? Yes, why is it still elevated? Sir, it can be uh, either a new event of uh, pancreatitis, sir. That can cause uh, uh, very high rise in uh, amylase and lipase levels. Or, or could it be that there is the fluid collection persistence? Fluid collection itself can also lead to a persistence in elevation of amylase and lipase. When you have a fault of necrosis or a pseudosis, amylase and lipase can still be elevated after the first episode of oh. It can be elevated. Now, coming to the LFT part, uh, during the first admission, patient had mild transaminitis with a, a very mild rise in the alphine phosphorus. Uh, so at this point of time, uh, with this uh, picture of LFT, I would suspect a biliary pancreatitis. And uh, uh, during the discharge, the transaminitis has uh, resolved and uh, LP came down. And uh, uh, during the uh, second admission, the, uh, there is no transaminitis with a very mild rise in the ALP. So what is your pointers for a, a biliary pancreatitis in the first episode? Uh, can you just uh, elaborate a bit more in detail? Yes, sir. Uh, in case of pancreat, uh, patient presenting with a pancreatitis, uh, if the LFTs are abnormal, uh, it is uh, most 90% uh, sensitivity that the patient is having a biliary etiology of a pancreatitis, sir. Which, which, uh, which parameters in the liver function test I would you focus on? Uh, I'd be focusing on the transaminitis and the uh, ALT, mostly for biliary pancreatitis. So you'd focus on the ALT? Transaminitis, and... sir, SGPT. In transaminitis, uh, SGPT, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, just, uh, just for the sake of all residents, I have a problem with a word called transaminitis. Because itis means inflammation, transaminases are not organs, they do not get inflamed. So uh, we should just avoid that word called transaminitis. It's just a uh, misnomer. <laughs> yeah, so just again, transaminases, elevated transaminases, and yeah, AST, ALT elevation. And ALT more than three times upper limit of normal is, has shown to have a very high positive predictive value. ALT in a meta-analysis has shown that if the ALT elevations of more than three times upper limit of normal has almost a 95% positive predictive value of biliary pancreatitis. That's very good. So it has come down to normal. Yeah, please proceed. Sorry. Uh, can I ask one so, question? Uh, just a point here. Uh, if you just have an isolated elevation of alkaline phosphatase, it may exactly. well be was... because of the pancreatic head edema compressing upon the bile duct causing the elevation. So that uh, that you have to remember. So it may not really indicate alf alkaline phosphatase uh, elevation alone may not uh, uh, reflect biliary pancreatitis. Janta, you were saying uh, something. Yes, sir. I was about to make this point only. Yes, sir. Yes. Go ahead. There's actually one more question in the chat box, which says, do you require to do both amylase and lipase in all patients? 
Uh, what is the current uh, guideline? Is lipase alone sufficient? Yes. There's no guideline, but lipase alone is sufficient. You don't need to do both. Because we think that it takes care of both early and late. So probably yes. lipase would be probably the very ideal situation. Yes. In this yeah, go uh, ahead, please. Yes, sir. Uh, coming to the uh, renal function test, uh, there are normal in both, both the admission periods. Okay. Uh, any other investigations? Uh, uh, I would like to uh, do an etiological workup with the uh, uh, fasting lipid profile. Uh, and the uh, lipid profile, the total cholesterol and uh, triglycerides uh, are no within normal limits. Uh, the HDL is slightly on the lower, lower level. The rest of the parameters are normal. So why are you doing this test, lipid profile? So uh, we need to uh, rule out... Um, uh, one of the um, uh, common cause of our uh, pancreatitis is hypertriglyceridemia. If the values of our triglycerides are 1000, then the etiology would be attributed to the hypertriglyceridemia. Yeah, true. At what level of triglycerides does the risk increase? It, risk increases beyond 500. Absolutely. Very good. So, yeah, as the risk goes beyond 500, the risk increases. At 1000, uh, it's that 5%. At 2000, it's 10 to 20%. Yeah, very good. So, Dipto, can I uh, uh, add one here? So, yes, to all the residents, once you make a diagnosis, once you invest, start investigating, first confirm diagnosis, then go to etiology. So, primary investigation that way, that first you confirm what your diagnosis, then look at etiology. Next investigation. One more point can I make regarding this triglyceride? Yeah, I think there are two important issues. Uh, one is that uh, high, uh, although people, uh, there are multiple data and studies which suggest that probably the etiology does not uh, affect the outcome in cases of acute pancreatitis, but there are some studies which have shown that hypertriglyceridemia induced pancreatitis probably have a much more severe course as compared to the other etiologies. This is one. And uh, one more important point is that even at even if it is not uh, hypertriglyceridemia to that level which will cause acute pancreatitis, but even our baseline high level of hypertriglyceridemia has been shown to have an adverse or progno uh, adverse prognosis in patients with acute pancreatitis. Uh, Sudipto sir and Praveen sir for the, for any comments sir. Yeah, uh, Jan, there are two very large uh, cohort studies done in the Scandinavian countries which have shown that actually the risk starts to increase almost uh, about, if I, I may be quoting wrong, so I don't want to quote this here, but it must be around 1.4 is the odds ratio, which was uh, increasing beyond 200. So actually yes, the sir. risk starts to increase incrementally beyond 200. There are two very good uh, Scandinavian uh, studies, Absolutely. very large studies from Scandinavian countries, which have shown that hypertriglyceridemia risk actually starts to increase beyond 200. Now, when you're talking of hypertriglyceridemia, one thing we have to remember is that not in the context of this particular patient, but any other patient, during the episode of acute pancreatitis, we may still find these levels to be low. It's after the recovery of acute pancreatitis, we have to again recheck this parameters of the patient because sometimes during the episode of acute pancreatitis, the triglycerides may drop down and rise again once the patient recovers from the episode. Because when the patient is fasting, the levels might again drop down and again rise once the patient has started to go back to his normal diet. Right, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, coming to the next investigation, uh, I would like to see them catch him. Uh, here uh, on both admissions, serum calcium level was normal, and next uh, inflammatory uh, markers with the CRP, uh, which is a uh, high uh, uh, in the uh, current admission and also in the old admission, which came down before the discharge. Well, most important thing is the procalcitonin, which was normal during the first admission, and uh, here the procalcitonin level is 6.2, which is significant because generally the procalcitonin level. Uh, can rise in acute pancreatitis even without uh, in, uh, infection, but beyond the 2, 2.2 to 2.5 value, it signifies that there is an infection, uh, ongoing infection. But the blood cultures were uh, normal, and regarding the etiological workup, uh, to rule out malignancy, CA99 and CA were done with 
which are in normal limits. So I would rule out uh, uh, hypercalcemic induced and uh, malignancy uh, induced pancreatitis with these investigations. Mm. Uh, any other investigation? I'd like to uh, have a uh, plain uh, X-ray, sir. X-ray chest and X-ray uh, abdomen. No, abdomen. Uh, uh, you see, at this point of time, actually, Govind, Dr. Govind Makhari had pointed a very, very important uh, point. And what you need to tell me at this point of time, are you convinced about the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis with fluid collection? Uh, fluid collection uh, might be so, but I'm convinced with acute pancreatitis infected with the perifluid collection. What so, what is the criteria for diagnosis of acute pancreatitis? For acute pancreatitis, the patient should have a typical pancreatic type, uh, pancreatic type of pain with uh, rise in a serum amylase lipase levels three times upper limit of normal and with the radiological uh, confirmation. So, Either two, any two of the three should be present to diagnose it as a pancreatitis. Okay, so I, I think even without an ultrasound imaging, you are convinced about the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis based upon the typical history and based upon the reports of amylase and lipase which are elevated. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yeah, so now the purpose of the cross sectional imaging will primarily be one to look for etiology. Second is to look for complications. So these are the two reasons why you will need an imaging. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, so again, what investigation do you want? I think sir has uh, kind of pushed you in a particular direction. Uh, uh, just one, one more point, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, the point of making it uh, uh, is always to go simple. That uh, it could pancreatitis. You want to do like the sound. You want to do CT scan. So go straight rather than doing an X-ray because X-ray is not going to add any value to you. You, look, you do X-ray for looking at chest infection, but they come later. So but it's not about going slow, but this is what you do in outpatient every day. That in a keeping you first do a cross sectional imaging to to look at look at to look at how much is the damage caused by pancreatitis. And other point that we have just done 15 minutes to 20 minutes left. So we can hurry up slight. So we go to management, which is yeah. so important. So we can skip all those investigations were not necessary. We go to main investigations and then treat. Uh, uh, okay. So I would like to go for a contrast and hence CT of pancreas. So this is the old CT of the abdomen. Is the, this is a contrast and hence CT of abdomen, which is showing uh, Bulky pancreas and there is a hypo uh, hyperdense uh, uh, lesion noted in the D2 segments. Uh, probably calculus, positive okay. calculus. So, okay, go ahead. I, I don't think we can be sure that it's calculus or some tablet or don't, I don't know what it is. Okay. Go ahead. We are diverticulum with material. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is the August scan. Yes, sir. this is a MRI abdomen which was showing uh, a hyper intense lesion with a, with a well formed wall in the body and tail of a pancreas with a hypo intense collections noted within the, ca within the fluid cavity. So, probably significant uh, a necrosis or debris in the pancreas so uh, it would be a, a wall of necrosis uh, my differential diagnosis would be a wall of necrosis at this point okay, okay so what will you do now so uh, because the patient uh, had a significant history of, uh, history of fever and the uh, imaging finding is a history of a wall of necrosis I would like to first quantify the uh, amount of necrosis. If, uh, uh, based on that, we can uh, intervene uh, whether we will go for a US guided procedure for, uh, um, for quantifying the necrosis, uh, the, uh, for diagnosis EUS. And if uh, 
necrotic part is greater uh, uh, is if it is less than 10 percent we can uh, plan uh, placing a plastic stand if it is greater than uh, gotham so how do you quantify the amount of necrosis within the world of necrosis what uh, what imaging modality would you choose Sorry, endoscopic ultrasound. Well, we already have an MRI, and MRI is a very good test to demonstrate the amount of necrosis within the one. And I don't know what additional benefit an US will give in thing. What? The uh, uh, MRI is a very good test. You do an US only to do the procedure. Not to quantify the amount of necrosis. What do you say, Dr. Praveer? I don't know. Yeah, I think uh, that's true. Uh, MR gives almost all the information that you will be getting on EUS. Moreover, the purpose here is to pick up the extent of necrosis, to look for the number of collections that we have, and to decide upon the treatment modalities. So right now, what you are seeing is a collection in the lesser sac. So if you have collection in the paracolic region, then possibly you would have resorted to other measures rather than doing an endoscopic measure alone. So that's the purpose why you are doing an imaging. As far as extent of necrosis is concerned, I think it's very well related to an MR. Yeah. So go ahead. What will you do in this case now? So, uh, I would like to do an uh, Can I go ahead? Can I go ahead? Go ahead. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yes. I would like to do a therapeutic procedure sir, uh, to drain the wall of necrosis. What therapeutic? The, uh, because it, it is a close, uh, close to the gastric wall, uh, we can do an uh, US guided uh, gastrocystosomy sir, with uh, lumen opposing metallic stent placing a uh, lamp. Sir. Yeah, so uh, just tell me what will be the advantage of an EUS or endoscopic procedure compared to a percutaneous tube? The advantage would be uh, in US guided procedure, uh, the generally it is done when it is closer to the stomach wall or a duodenal wall, uh, wall, which is easily accessible. So in case if it is away from the wall, we need to go for a percutaneous uh, procedures. Uh, and uh, in case of a percutaneous procedure, we need to uh, initially uh, cannulate. And uh, uh, once the tract is formed, we need to dilate. So we need to wait for that. And after that only we... Uh... Yeah, so see, what I want to know from you is that what are the distinct advantages of EUS guided or endoscopic intervention compared to a percutaneous spinach? I just need two, three points. They are well documented now in studies because a radiologist will tell you that he can do the job. Vice versa, where do we play the percutaneous intervention in the management of fonts? Sir, okay, so fair enough. So I, I think the reason why you are intervening endoscopically or EVS guided are one, it ensures an internal drainage. The patient is free of a percutaneous tube, one. Second, it has been shown in multiple studies that the chances of reintervention is more when you're doing a percutaneous drainage compared to a endoscopic drainage. So you can see a tube hanging outside in a patient he, for him, Moving with that tube again causes a lot of discomfort. So there is hardly any doubt that in patients with possibly pseudocyst, the EUS guided drainage is the way forward. So what uh, uh, the question was put forward, where will you do an percutaneous drainage? Uh, when there is not, uh, when the wall is not fall, uh, formed well enough for uh, uh, when the necrosis is not fully evolved, uh, probably we can consider percutaneous drainage, uh, sir. And also in unstable patients. Unstable patients when the endoscopic intervention uh, is not possible in those patients also percutaneous intervention can be. 
Yeah, and they, I think uh, the collections which are distant from the GI tract, usually the paracolix one, unstable patient where patient cannot, un you cannot take the patient up for an endoscopic drainage. So these are two important reasons or a lot of necrotic debris, uh, maybe more than 50% or 60% where even you don't want to do an endoscopic necrosecty. So those are the cases where possibly you may choose to do a percutaneous drainage. And I, I think, sir, one more additional point that I'd like to make is that uh, percutaneous drainage uh, with endoscopic drainage, we avoid the chances of an EPF development, a development of external pancreatic fistula. So that we can avoid. So go ahead. Yes, sir. You have some more slides, sir? Yeah. I think I'll, I'll just show the US. So uh, you mentioned that you would do a drainage with a lumen posing metal stent. This is what you said. And uh, what you are showing is possibly again, the deployment of a metal stent. So what I want to know is suppose it is just a cetosis. Do you have evidence at this point of time to say that the metal stent is better compared to a plastic? No, sir, as of now, uh... For cirrhosis management, only uh, plastic stents are better, sir. And uh, even we can use multi, uh, multiple plastic stents. In case of very large cirrhosis, only the uh, metal stent will be useful, sir. Do we have that evidence that so, large uh, cirrhosis uh, metal stents are better? No, sir. I so I, I don't think uh, that we have evidence to say that for cirrhosis metal stents are any way better. Can you just run through this video, and can you tell me that on US, what do you think is the extent of necrosis here? Yes, sir. Uh, it is occupied. Uh, the hyperacuic region in the cyst cavity is occupying almost uh, greater than one third space of the cavity cell. So probably 35%. Yeah, so that will be anyone's guess. I think it's uh, uh, usually very difficult to say what is the it's extent very of the It is a uh, very, very subjective very issue. Very subjective. Until you have gross amount of necrotic material, I think 30% is a very, very vague number. And I don't know. We all say 30%, but I, until there is solid necrotic mark, I'm not sure about 30% in this particular case. Absolutely, sir. So, and as for the uh, for Gautam, as for the data suggests that as Praveen Raisar was uh, pointing out, for pseudocyst, stent is something which is recommended. Even ESG clearly recommends that it is plastic stents that you have to place. Metal stents should be placed only if there is a research or a trial going on. This is point one. And point two, multiple studies and even meta-analysis recent has clearly suggested that plastic and metal both fare equally as far as the uh, efficacy and the adverse events are concerned. Uh, for one as well. So, uh, if you look at the last study which came in from Dr. Sham's group on metal versus plastic in WON per se, in fact, they have not shown a superiority of metal over plastic stents. And in fact, the adverse events in metal was slightly higher. Of course, that was primarily because they did not remove the stent at three weeks interval, which Absolutely. was supposed to have happened. Once they adjusted for that, the, the adverse events were almost similar in both the arms which goes on to show probably we are still far away from understanding which is superior to that uh, between plastic versus metal. Probably yeah, sir, the so only advantage would be uh, for the metal would be the procedure time. So if a sicker patient is there, probably you can you would like to just put a metal and come out immediately. But common sense tells you that when you have large amount of necrosis, it's always, you know, you are tempted to have a large, big size hold so that you assume that necrotic material will come out Absolutely. easily. It's common Absolutely. sense to believe that it should be the way to go. Absolutely. Yeah. So a question to all the panelists, sir, based on the US, which he had done in this evasion, the amount of necrosis and the general condition of the patient with fever, spiking temperature, leukocytosis, what would be the approach on this patient? Would, would the 
probably intervene with an idea that you might require re-intervention at a later time? Or would we just do, because the studies have shown no big difference between plastic and metal stent, would we get away with the plastic stent in this patient? So I, I think just comment on that. And before, uh, as may, everyone has heard that there is a, again, a confusion what to do in a world of pancreatic necrosis. So once that is the case, possibly we should be going by the guidelines. So what does the AGA review gastroenterology 2020 suggests? So the, what they have suggested that self-expanding metal stent, possibly the lumen opposing metal stent are possibly superior to plastic stents for endoscopic transmural drainage of necrosis. This is what, again, the level of evidence would be weak here, but this is what is the recommendation by AGA review in gastroenterology. So as far as your question is concerned, what we do in our center, that if it's a clear pseudocyst, we place, uh, we can choose to place a plastic stent, but if there is necrosis, whatever extent it is, 10, 20, 30%, we end up placing a metal stent. This is what we do. And the reason why we do is, I think uh, we what is clear is when you have some amount of necrosis after drainage, what happens? Many of these patients get infected, and then possibly you will need to do an endoscopic necrosectomy, which is better performed when you have a metal stent or a lumen opposing metal stent in place compared to a plastic stent where you will need to go do, remove the stents, do the dilatation, and then do a necrosectomy. So if necrosectomy is in the cards, then lumen opposing metal stent may be the way forward. That was also our thought, sir, that we might require a re-intervention in this patient. So I think, that the, I think it's all individual based. I think one need to probably take everything, the whole patient into consideration before we make a decision because everything is costing. Everything of the corporate center, like everything is a costing thing. So uh, to do off with just plastic stent and face more complications later on would probably would lean to a more definitive procedure like a metal stent. Uh, yeah. Just to give a, a, a word of caution, whenever we place metal stents, we have to remember we have to remove it within three yes. weeks. That's that's right. right. That is a way of paramount absolutely. importance. Complication tend to increase after three weeks. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I will just make a point here, but again, uh, this is uh, oh, this is when you're using the axios, not with yeah. the. Uh, this is primarily with axios. Yeah, this is for so this is for lambs we, basically, not for an agi maybe. Not, not for an agi. I think that's very important to recognize this. So uh, I think the whole concern of GIB related to stent came from the gut article, which showed around three patients we had who had massive GIB, and this was because of lumen opposing metal stent, which is a hot axial stent. We have done sixty patients till date with nagi stent, and we. It removed all of these stents at a period of three months. I can now this study is also published. That study had has 45 patients. Uh, it's now online in Saudi Journal of Gastroenterology. 45 patients stents removed at a period of three months. No bleeding in any patient. So what I think is possibly this hot axios is a bit stiffer stent with the flanges are a bit wide. It's 27 millimeter flanges. So the risk of erosion of the vessel is possibly more compared to a softer Nagi stent or the other stents which are in place. Yeah. So I think we are running short of time. Can you show what was done in this particular case? Yes, sir. What we had done was uh, put a lumen opposing metal stent in this patient. And about 100 ml of purulent discharge uh, uh, was uh, drained and sent for culture and sensitivity. The culture sensitivity identified Pseudomonas cutida as the organism and uh, appropriate antibiotic has been started based upon the culture sensitivity report. The, uh, the patient uh, was on follow up uh, for a, a period of one month. After three weeks, uh, the uh, stent was removed. Uh, he showed a, a significant uh, uh, improvement. Uh, he didn't require any necrosectomy after the uh, stent was uh, placed. Dr. Sneezer? Yeah. 
Mm. I think uh, that's for sure. I think you had a couple of slides, the very pertinent regarding uh, stents, infected okay. ma management of infected stents. Uh, As, uh, Dr. Govin said, we can go up to 1240. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, I think since we can go up 1240, I can, I have just a few more important points to make. Sure, sir. So wonderful, wonderful. You, yeah. you chose to place a hot axio stent here. So do you think that you can, you could have placed a cheaper uh, stents that are available, Nagi stent or any other stent? Or you think uh, the hot axios does a better job? Because that because point of consumption, more. yes, sir. Point of consumption, we could have used a cheaper stent, but we thought that he might require re intervention, so we probably went ahead with the not then uh, thinking that he might require re intervention. Uh, yeah, so the only point I'm trying to make is that uh, suppose the patient is not having sufficient finances because it's a costly stent. So whatever you can achieve with a hot axios can well be achieved by the other stents that are available because those all are fully covered stents, by flange stents, and uh, cost is the uh, hot axios is possibly two or three times costlier. You can do a necrosectomy with other stents as well. So that can uh, that you can perfectly do. The only advantage with the hot axios is I can tell you that if you are less experienced. Even then, you can do the drainage procedure well. So you just need to know the steps, and you can perform the procedure. However, if you are deploying other stents, sometimes you may uh, fail if you are if you are doing few few new uh, only you have done only a few cases. Then you can fail at the point of time. So that's the advantage of hot axial stent. Small comment is uh, we could have discussed the three D MRCP picture because etiology is still not clear. So this is one point we could have been there. We could have discussed in the background. Second, uh, hot nagi is also you now getting available. So we can go, the cost is again almost half. So now, when will you remove this stent? You have deployed a hot axios. Sir, after a period of uh, uh, three weeks, uh, we assess for the, uh, we, we do a key procedure MRCP check for any disconnected duct. If there is any, uh, if there is no evidence of any disconnected duct, we can remove the hot axio system after a period of uh, uh, three weeks, sir. but if there is any, any evidence of the uh, uh, pancreatic duct disconnection, probably the patient requires a, a pancreatic duct stenting and spinterotomy, uh, following which uh, uh, the uh, patient might be requiring a plastic stent insertion after removal of the uh, metal stent. And uh, the stent might be, uh, uh, should be left in place for a much longer duration uh, for the disconnected to heal. Yeah, so you mentioned a term disconnected duct. So now that entity is there, disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome. So what is the definition of that? Sir, uh, definition of uh, disconnected duct syndrome is uh, when there is extravasation of the contrast from the uh, uh, main pancreatic duct during the ERCP procedure with the uh, functioning pancreatic uh, uh, parenchyma distal to the obstruction and uh, greater than two centimeters involvement of the uh, of pancreatic necrosis. Absolutely, yeah, you are correct. Very good. So, uh, in this, in you mentioned about doing an MRCP. So, you think doing an MRCP it gives you the whole information of ductal disruption, or you need some uh, other imaging modality? Vikram, yes, sir. MRCP might not give the full information about the uh, disconnected uh, 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 pancreatic uh, duct, sir. Uh, only at ERCP can we fully recognize uh, uh, disconnected duct. Yeah, so the gold standard for the diagnosis of the disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome is an ERCP, which obviously is invasive, but that's the one which will give, which is considered the gold standard for diagnosis. Yeah. Okay, uh, just a note on... Uh... Uh, see that, a uh, couple of things. Uh, can we discuss uh, other aspect of pancreatitis? What is relevant in this patient? Like uh, uh, other things, uh, other than only pseudocyst or uh, uh, water pancreatic necrosis, other aspects? 
yeah i think nutrition is very very important in this particular case but how would this uh, suppose in the first episode which he had presented to you uh, the first episode which was in april uh, so if he had presented to you in the in april what would you have given him for nutrition and fluid in the you have a diagnosis of pancreatitis made so what would be your initial fluids and nutrition so the patient presented in the second day of illness uh, uh, second day of illness with the hemo concentration with the pc of 47000 uh, 47 percent sorry uh, he requires aggressive fluid management with a bolus of uh, 15 to 30 ml of uh, uh, 15 to 20 ml of uh, iv bolus single latter followed uh, by a maintenance of 1.5 to 3 ml uh, per hour uh, of uh, ringer lactate sir uh, since he is also having a component of uh, sips uh, will replace the fluid and uh, coming to the nutrition once his uh, pain uh, begins no, no, to no, no. first 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 let us uh, look about the fluids that you mentioned why do you want to give ringer lactate sir uh, crystalloids are uh, crystalloids and among crystalloids ringer lactate has uh, shown better uh, uh, a uh, better uh, outcomes in uh, uh, among the fluids uh, because uh, so, uh, normal saline can cause uh, hyperchloremic acidosis uh, in these patients so any other reason it can uh, normal saline can cause hyperchloremic uh, and then what what maybe the, what is the advantage of ringer lactate any other advantage isosmolar uh, isosmolar uh, so it's considered to be more ph balanced compared to normal saline one it it is assumed that it may have some anti inflammatory action however uh, the latest recommendation by aga they say that you can use either a ringer lactate or a normal saline so these recommendations from different society do vary the uh, from aga 2018 they suggest that you can use either This is what they suggest. However, in uh, the some other societies do suggest that ringer lactate may be preferred. So, how much fluid? How much? Sir, in the mild pancreatitis, uh, 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 even if we give aggressive fluid management, also uh, the, the outcomes. Uh, uh, 3.6 liters of fluid sequestration in mild pancreatitis and about 5.6 liters in moderate to severe pancreatitis was noted so probably we can go ahead with the replacement of the same volume in this patients yeah so the guidelines do recommend a amount obviously it has to be titrated so the amount that is recommended is 5 to 10 ml per kg per hour this is so, what is recommended but obviously you don't continue it for straight away 48 hours you reassess the patient at a period of around 6 hours and how do you reassess what do you assess at 6 hours if you give 5 to 10 ml per kg per hour what are the parameters that you want to assess so that so that you don't overload this patient with fluid the uh, urine output of at least 0.5 to 1 uh, ml per hour with the mean arterial uh, pressure greater than uh, 70 uh, mm uh, hg and uh, uh, and we can monitor with the uh, ipc uh, uh, diameter uh, as a yeah also so so we, we, we targeted a, fluid uh, resuscitation based on urine output and mean arterial pressure heart rate stroke volume variation intrathoracic blood volume and uh, uh, hematocrit sorry and hematocrit this is the iap recommendation yeah so uh, then this you continue this resuscitation for a period of at least 24 to 48 hours and assessing all these parameters which dr sudipto has mentioned every 6 hour day so that obviously you need to consider the cardiac status of the patient age of the patient underlying comorbid illness those all factors need to be taken care of before you are transfusing aggressive fluid so that uh, the patient doesn't go into heart failure so uh, what about nutrition when do you start nutrition in patients with acute pancreatitis can i just add one comment here dr praveen please 
Uh, just to remember that in our country, most of the patients do not come within the golden period of resuscitation, that is the 12 to 24 hours. Most patients come after 24 hours or sometimes after 72 hours. So remember when we're talking about this targeted goal-based approach of 510 ml of fluid, uh, that fluid approach is only for those people who come in early. If you try to give that volume of fluid in a person who's coming late in the course of illness, we'll end up flooding the lungs. So just to remember this particular caveat that this particular approach is applicable only to those group of individuals who come in very early in the course of acute pancreatitis and not to everyone. And that early is within 48 hours. Up yes. to 48 hours. Yeah. So about nutrition, when will you, a patient has come to, this patient had come to you in April, when will you start feeding this patient and what will you feed him? Sir, uh, uh, the patient had a moderately severe, uh, uh, possibly moderately severe pancreatitis, sir. We should uh, consider nutrition from uh, uh, day two to uh, uh, day three of a uh, uh, presentation itself. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, since he may, uh, since the patient is in ICU, he might not be able to tolerate oral fluids. We should consider uh, nasogastric or nasogastrical uh, uh, tube placement and uh, caloric requirement uh, uh, at the rate of uh, 25 to 30 kilocalories and protein requirement of uh, 1 to 1 1.5 uh, grams per kg. Okay, so I think let us be clear that if the patient is not vomiting profusely, there isn't severe abdominal pain which because of which he cannot take fluid, the intake, the uh, the diet should be started as early as possible, which is within 24 hours you can start. About NJ or NG, it does not matter. It, there are now multiple studies to show that both have the same results. There, it doesn't make any difference whether you are placing an NJ or an NG. So what diet will you suggest? Sir, uh, easily uh, digestible low-fat diet uh, or a liquid diet. Uh... You can uh, suggest. Yeah, any comment on that? What diet? Uh, low fat diet. Uh... Yeah, so this is what um, AGA recommends. However, the other societies don't recommend any specific diet. Uh, it's just uh, low fat, soft diet is what is recommended by AGA. I think that diet recommendation came from Espen. So I, I think there is no hardcore evidence to suggest low fat diet, but it's more of a consensus evidence that you give low fat diet. Yeah, but low fat soft diet is what is recommended. Yeah. But as you said correctly, early oral feeding as much as tolerated and if they're not tolerated, start off to your feeding. And I, I think a very important point is that why are we stressing upon this oral uh, early feed? The reason is that now there are clear studies to show that early enteral feeding decreases the risk of mortality and complications. So that is very, very clear. So this simple thing that early nutrition, early enteral feed will decrease the risk of mortality or the complications. So that's uh, the reason why it's very, very important. So any comment about antibiotics? Small feeding, if I can interrupt. I mean, yes, it, it has to be early, but very early feeding, which was there in the data of, I mean, uh, there's annual surgery had an article initially, very early feeding also may be avoided. There's a uh, Dutch NEGM trial, which has shown that even very early refeeding may at some you know uh, disadvantages so it's a very early it uh, can be as early as 24 hours and as rest of the thing dr praveen told again sir i think it depends upon the severity of the pancreatitis mild cases you could start earlier moderate to severe cases you probably need to delay it by at least 24 to 48 hours until the patient settles down for an early enteral feed Absolutely. That is, uh, I think, the Dutch study group that uh, that Dr. Uh, Pawan was mentioning about, that rather than force feeding, probably early feeding in, in a sense, when this patient starts able to better able to tolerate and all, at that point of time, the enteral feeding can be started. Here, I would like to reiterate one more fact is that when we talk about feeding, 
we don't talk about uh, complete nutrition going through the uh, through the enteral route meaning thereby ki even aliquots of fluid or uh, feed through the enteral route keeps the gut working and as dr praveer i was pointing about that the that decreases the gut translocation that decreases the that makes the gut uh, gut barrier function uh, uh, re establishment of the gut barrier function and probably that decreases the infective mortality uh, infective risk and the mortality risks later on so what you are talking about here jayant is probably trophic feeding have giving of yes, at least 500 kilo calories per absolutely. day just to maintain the gut barrier function just to maintain the gut absolutely so trophic feeding is what we are looking at and that's something which we can achieve by not giving high calorie food so it's just trophic feeding is just giving Sorry, a little bit of food i'm having trouble connecting to the internet it looks like a router issue yeah so i think i can see in chat box uh, um, about injection urinary statin so i don't think we have uh, sufficient evidence on this then i can see a question of any role of pert uh, this is enzyme replacement therapy in acute pancreatitis i think not in the initial phase later on if you have a severe necrosis these patients may have exocrine insufficiency at that point of time after testing or even sometimes without testing if you have sufficient symptoms then you may consider but not during the acute phase heparin mm -hmm. role uh, sudeep you would like to answer that in the chat box role of heparin uh heparin as a prophylaxis uh, heparin for a hospitalized patient yes as an uh, patient who's uh, on the bedridden patient who's on thing low molecular heparin as a profile dvt prophylaxis definitely yes but beyond it for treatment of splenic vein thrombosis in a patient who's got a splenic vein uh, an isolated splenic vein uh, thrombosis in the setting of acute pancreatitis has not been shown to have much benefit until unless there's extension of the thrombosis into either the portal vein or the superior mesenteric vein uh -huh. i think one more question that uh, shridhar has put up on the on the on the slide is pain management acute pancreatitis this area is something which is completely you know still uncharted uh, vikrant what do you think should be the pain management uh, protocol or what would you like to give as for pain management in acute pancreatitis sir so pain management i would uh, prefer the opioid analgesics as the first line sir followed by nsaids in, uh, in opioid uh, uh, probably we can uh, consider uh, tramadol and pantazosin as a, a good first line uh, uh, management uh, drugs and followed by if the patient is not responding we can consider uh, paracetamol iv infusion or uh, uh, other nsaids So probably you are talking about a, a, a WHO pain ladder pattern, right? So the data that suggests is there are very limited data on pain management in acute pancreatitis. This is point one. Yes, opioid analgesics are definitely better. Uh, has been proven better than the NSAIDs. There are two back-to-back -back RCTs, one from AIMS and one from our center, which has shown that uh, AIMS did a, a study and they showed that pentazosin was better than diclofenac, and our center showed that. Uh, uh diclofenac and tramadol both were working similar we have one more rct just uh, about to be getting published is that where where we have shown uh, we have seen that buprenorphine again an opioid analgesic is better than an said uh, for the pain management in acute pancreatitis uh, sudeep sir and pravi sir for your comments sir sir you muted yes, sir there is one sir. more question from dr jayanti asking the role of antioxidants in the management of pain in acute pancreatitis i think there is no no data to suggest that there is uh, any role of uh, antioxidants for pain management in acute pancreatitis definitely there is some data for chronic yes, but not yes, for sir. acute yes sir yes sir yes sir okay. pravi sir was say, saying something yes sir yeah Uh, no, no. I, I think uh, what you have mentioned rightly, and based on your studies and study from AIMS, those are the drugs that need to be considered for pain relief. So I think uh, another thing, actually, which we haven't discussed, maybe just a word of uh, word about that is antibiotics in acute pancreatitis, which is often misused. So uh, residents, any comment among that, Vikram? so uh, during the first to five days uh, the rise in the total counts is mostly like uh, because of the cyst response and the, the patient might not benefit in the first five days with an antibiotics if the patient is having persistent elevation during the second week and uh, in, in correlation with the rise in procalcitonin rise in the uh, crp probably we can consider the, an infective component and uh, probably might benefit of, of antibiotics if uh, there is high clinical suspicion during the second week of uh, uh, illness 
No, Vikrant. What I think what Praveen sir was asking is, let's say at day five, day six, the patient starts developing organ failure. Let's say at day five, the patient starts uh, uh, a new onset organ failure. Will you be giving antibiotic or not? Uh, sir, empirically, uh, we'll be starting antibiotics, sir. So can I come? Uh, can I comment here, Jayant? And yesterday, I don't know whether you followed my uh, presentation yesterday evening. Yes, sir. And yes, there was sir. a lot of. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I had this uh, sort of interesting uh, conversation yesterday. So if you look at the data that we have as of yet right now, and I'm going back to prophylactic antibiotics per se, there have been three definite meta-analysis which have looked at it. One was the Cochrane meta-analysis, seven studies did not show any benefit. Then this Japanese meta-analysis came in from the Japanese pancreatitis study group. They included six meta-analyses, uh, six studies, which included only imipenem as one of the drugs. And they showed benefit in mortality as well as infected pancreatic necrosis. Subsequently, a Chinese meta-analysis came in 2020, which showed no benefit. So amongst all the groups, I had enumerated all the societies. And amongst the societies, Japanese society is the only society which recommends use of prophylactic antibiotics within 72 hours. The Italian society says, do not use antibiotics. However, if the, if the necrosis is more than 50%, you may consider antibiotics based on a case-to-case -case basis. So what you're alluding to, Jant, is that in a situation where you have shock and sepsis, it's a case-to-case -case basis. If you're in Italy, you might use antibiotics. That's sort of a scenario. But other than that, none of the societies recommend use of antibiotics within the first week. Now, this link from Dutch pancreatitis study group clearly showed that the median of first infection starts off at eighth day. Day eight is the first infectious complication starts off. And from then on, it's usually bacteremia, pneumonia in the first, uh, at the end of first week, from second week onwards, infected pancreatic necrosis comes into play. So it's the first week onwards, it's bacteremia, pneumonia, as towards the end of first week, uh, second week, sorry, towards the end of second week is the infected necrosis when it comes into play. Absolutely. So at eight week onwards, we have definite evidence, the eight, eight day onwards, definite evidence that there is evidence of infection. But before that, it's anybody's guess whether you need to start antibiotics. And if a person is in shock and sepsis, I would leave it to a clinician's decision. Right, sir. I think uh, we are uh, very close to the uh, closing the session, but we can have last question on uh, etiology management after this episode is controlled. Maybe for two, three minutes to discuss that and then we can close it. Vikrant. And I think, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, in this patient, uh, the since the patient was having elevated uh, lipofunction test in the form of uh, elevated uh, uh, ALT and uh, uh, hyperdense lesion uh, uh, within the second part of the duodenum, we should strongly consider the possibility of uh, biliary pancreatitis uh, in this patient. He might uh, benefit from a uh, uh, cholecystectomy uh, uh, in this case, sir. When? Since the patient is having acute necrotizing pancreatitis, we should uh, uh, wait for the, uh, the necrosis, uh, I mean the symptoms of the pancreatic necrosis to subside and the infection subside only then uh, probably uh, we can advise cholecystectomy in this patient. So do you, Vikram, do you know of any evidence which suggests the timing of doing the cholecystectomy after, uh, after an episode of necrotizing pancreatitis in gallstone induced pancreatitis? I'm not aware. So there's a recent gut paper which examined this particular instance and the optimal timing of cholecystectomy after necrotizing biliary pancreatitis in absence of peripancreatic collections has been determined to be uh, within eight weeks after discharge. That's the EPIC trial that sir is suggesting and uh, all residents should be knowing about it. It's a very important landmark trial which has come into gut and I think we should all be aware of it. Right, uh, sir. I think we can close now because uh, uh, the program of medicine has started one, I think 1.30. So little time for lunch in between. Yeah, uh, just to interrupt, sir, so comment, uh, my... all the residents and of course others also are requested to join uh, the 
pgigiupdate.com that's the link uh, that has been shared with you guys so 130 sharp will be starting the sessions dr govind please uh, i think thank you so very much uh, everyone for this wonderful case discussion on on acute pancreatitis and its complications i think thank a lot you, of dr govind for giving us a chance to present this case and i congratulate my residents who have done a good job on this case presentation and thanks all the panelists on here Dr. Samantha, Dr. Rai, Sutto, and Thank Dr. Sridhar for all their contributions. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely, I think we must Thank all you, congratulate. We must all congratulate both Pikrant and and Gautam. Sir, they did uh, a wonderful, wonderful job. Yes, uh, sir. You want to say something, Jyanta? Yeah, uh, sir, sir, um, uh, ma'am, just wanted. Uh, uh, can I just announce all the sessions that are upcoming for the uh, the PGIGI update? The sessions yes. are uh, gastroenterologist and surgeons interface. Uh, the second session will be on uh, the next session is acute liver emergencies and the final session uh, and uh, there is one more session on pancreatic injury uh, post blunt abdominal trauma and finally the luminal emergencies so these are the four sessions that are there and there is an interesting quiz session after that thank you sir perfect over to you sir perfect. yes perfect so thank you so very much everyone uh, dr ganesh uh, the wonderful case you chose from your institute uh, and got them in the and we can't do a wonderful job. I think we must thank uh, uh, Dr. Sudipto, Dr. Praveen Rai, Dr. Jayanta Samant, and Dr. Pawan Dawal, and Dr. Sridhar for taking this case through all through, uh, discussing all important points so which concerns a patient with acute pancreatitis. Uh, thank you so very much. And I'm sure everybody got benefit. I must thank all the participants of this uh, masterclass. I hope that they are useful to you. And we also want feedback that how, how better, uh, we, how, how do we make it better uh, in terms of its uh, academic quality. So we look forward to your feedbacks uh, uh, to be written to us uh, on the same email. That's at the secretary at rate of isc.org.in. If you can send your feedback, that will be wonderful. And we can incorporate. Uh, our apology for certain echoes happened during the transmission today. Uh, but uh, we'll try to take care that this doesn't happen in our next session. Before we close, let me announce uh, the next masterclass will be on 17th of uh, October. On 10th of October, that's the next Sunday, we are organizing Gastroenterology Young Masters, which is a unique program uh, by ISU for residents, uh, third year residents. So this program is uh, done in New Delhi as uh, a physical program. Uh, on next Sunday. So next Sunday, we will not have masterclass. So we will have a next masterclass, uh, virtual masterclass on 17th of October. And the case will be a patient with dysphagia. But before we close, uh, we need to uh, request you to send your abstract for ISG, ISGCon 2022 or 2021. This is being held in Pune in February uh, 2022. Uh, last date of abstract submission is 15th of October. We just have 10 days left. So please do send your abstracts. Do send a pay for a plenary session and also for young investigator award session. For plenary and young investigator, we need your full paper, but otherwise you can submit any abstracts. And we need to hurry about that. It's just 10 more days left. Regarding all these masterclass, previous masterclass, the videos are uploaded on the ISC website. Uh, this is a, that is a ISG library. You will find ISG library and all the all the videos are uploaded there. And also you can watch through YouTube. With this, uh, uh, we close the, today's masterclass and we request all of you to join the G, PGI GI emergency course, which is going to start uh, in half an hour from now. Till then, have a great day ahead. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank Denise. Thank you, Yogita, for organizing this uh, uh, meeting. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, sir.